Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. On behalf of our sponsors, Renus, Irish Rail, and our media partner, Fleet Magazine, you're all very welcome. My name is Simon McKeever. I'm the Chief Executive of the Irish Exporters Association, and I'll be chairing the webinar this afternoon. I'm delighted that we have Louise Byrne, who is Head of the Brexit and International Trade at the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine. <clears throat> Just a little bit about Louise. She has worked for the department since 1998, primarily in areas relating to animal breeding and official controls along the agri-food of food chain, feed chain. Sorry. Louise was appointed Head of Brexit and International Trade Division in March 2019, where she has responsibility for coordinating the department's response to the UK decision to leave the EU with a current focus on achieving the optimum policy framework for the Irish agri-food and fishery sector and the rural economy in the wake of Brexit and in the context of developments in the international trading environment were more widely, including EU free trade agreements with third countries and WTO agreements. You're very welcome, Louise. So just before I hand over to you, Louise, I just wanted to give a message to all our listeners from, from those of us in the IRA, the IEA, excuse me. And that's just to say that um, we are open. We're definitely here. All our services are open. Um, our consular service is open. Uh, we're beginning to see a little bit of interest coming back in um, on, on the travel side. Uh, on the documentation side, it's still very much open. So we are um, we are still notarizing um, uh, the documentation for people providing certificates and apostille services. And that's for certs of incorporation, certs of origin, export certificates, HPRA, certs of free sale, GMP compliance, uh, uh, manufacturer's authorization, pharmaceutical product, <clears throat> invoices, letters of appointment, power of attorney, and price lists. Um, please check our website and contact Michael Nocton at irishexporters.ie before you send in any documents. Uh, I suppose most importantly in the context of today's um, webinar, uh, just to say all our training courses are, are up and running. Uh, <clears throat> there is a huge demand for them, particularly in light of Brexit coming um, uh, uh, on. Um, uh, three in particular that would be of interest to people. The 2nd of July, there's an AEO workshop. Uh, what's, all that, what's that all about? How to make an AEO application to revenue and what tools you need, to, you need to apply. How to apply and maintain AEO status in Ireland. How to implement AEO in your company through written procedures and internal processes and the benefits of being a trusted trader. That's on the 2nd of July. 11th of August, we have Customs Awareness Level 1, classification and valuation, and how to calculate and pay import duty and taxes and compare and contrast origin criteria. Um, that's on the 11th of August. And then our sixth intake of our certificate on, in international trade um, commences on September the 8th. We're, we're currently halfway through our fifth. Um, what's that all about? So that's a pretty comprehensive, in-depth um, uh, course covering inco terms and international contracts, import-export documentation and procedures, customs regulations, tariff codes and classification, valuation and origin, and AEO. Um, there is fun. Sorry, that next one is on the 8th of September. Uh, that's that's based. Uh, that's every two weeks. It's a full day. Full day, every two weeks over a period of um, six intakes. Uh, there is funding support available for a lot of our courses, so please check out our website, irishexporters.ie, and contact Fiona Luciani at irishexporters.ie or Niamh Burke at irishexporters.ie. And our export series uh, of webinars continues with the focus, an increasing focus on Brexit. This is our third in the space of 10 days, um, <clears throat> all of which are full. Um, and on the 8th of July, we will have our next uh, with the Brexit unit of the NSAI. Um, so, uh, and please, please be sure to check out our special episode of our podcast on COVID-19 with Patrick Joy uh, from SureTank. Uh, please contact Martin Murren at irishexporters.ie for any of our events. Um, just a little bit about the system. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the platform, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box of your WebEx control panel. Please select all panelists when asking your question, and I will read them out to our speaker after she makes her presentation. Uh, just be aware that all lines will be muted throughout. If you have any trouble hearing the pre presentation and the presenter, we advise you to dial in via your telephone. That's the little audio connection options button in your WebEx control portal, the telephone uh, panel, that's a telephone symbol at the bottom of your screen, and contact the Cisco WebEx Event Help Center should you experience any technical difficulties. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Louise Byrne. Louise, over to you. 
Good afternoon, Simon, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to your webinar to give you an update on uh, Brexit. Um, as of today's date, and things move fairly fast on Brexit, so uh, uh, I'm sure there'll be further updates. So, um, the state of play currently, as you know, the UK formally left the EU on the 1st of February 2020, and it's now in a transition period where effectively things remain the same for people who are trading with the UK, where they continue to apply the rules of the customs union and the single market. Um, at the joint committee meeting on the 12th of June, the UK confirmed to the EU that they will not be seeking an extension to the transition period, which will now end on the 31st of December 2020. So the 1st of January 2021 will bring significant change in the EU-UK trading relationship. The UK will be a third country opera operating outside the EU's customs union and single market. Therefore, new customs and SDS requirements will apply to trade with Great Britain, regardless of whether there is a trade agreement between the EU and the UK. These new regulatory requirements will add cost and will cause delays for industry, but these can be minimised through adequate preparation in advance of the 1st of January by both operators and by uh, authorities and agencies. There are a range of supports available to assist traders prepare for the new trading reality. And I would encourage those listening and the wider community to avail of those supports. The Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, in conjunction with other government departments and agencies, has been preparing for Brexit for a number of years to ensure that the necessary controls are conducted in a manner that ensures the minimum possible disruption to trade flows, whilst ensuring compliance with EU single market and customs union requirements. Louise, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You might just share your slides there, if that would be okay. Oh, I beg your pardon. Excuse me. Apologies. That's great. That's great. We can see them now. Okay. So, in relation to the EU-UK future relationship negotiations, there have been four rounds of negotiations to date, and these have been very challenging on a number of fronts. Um, challenging because we didn't have sight of the UK legal text for uh, um, up until quite recently. We still don't have sight of the UK non-papers. The negotiations, because of COVID, had to um, uh, take place uh, remotely. And that's, that, that has all added to the complexity uh, uh, of these negotiations. From an agriculture perspective, there are areas of convergence um, uh, where, where we agree with the UK in relation to tariff-free and quarter-free access. But also, there are very clear areas of divergence, including in relation to the level playing field, equivalence, rules of origin, fisheries. There is a further uh, series of sessions um, planned for the end of this month uh, and during July and August. These are critical talks. From my point of view, and I think others would share it, once the parties are talking, a deal can be done. And it's really important that uh, progress is made in these negotiations uh, to allow for the ratification in time for the 1st of January 2021 and to allow traders and authorities prepare fully for the new trading reality. In relation to the level playing field, both the EU and the UK are aiming for an ambitious tariff and quota free agreement. Given this level of access, it is necessary to ensure that robust level playing field provisions are agreed. This is to avoid unfair competition arising from having different rules in the UK and the EU. Alignment with relevant EU regulations, which the UK is doing already, would achieve this goal. 
However, in the negotiations, the UK has been clear that it wishes to be able to diverge from these EU regulations. Regarding rules of origin, these are used to determine whether your export can avail of uh, the preferential tariff rates um, agreed under a, a free trade agreement. These rules are quite specific and they vary depending on the product and the free trade agreement. Goods from the UK will have UK origin after the transition period, including goods from Northern Ireland. So if you use goods from UK, from the UK in your exports to third countries, you may not be able to avail of the reduced tariff rates under EU FTAs with those, con those third countries. Now, if an FTA is agreed between the EU and the UK, then the use of UK inputs in products exported to the UK would not prevent traders from availing of those uh, preferential tariff rates under that FTA. In relation to market access, there are certain um, agri-food products that are exported to certain countries that require health, uh, health certification that declare the country of origin. This is most commonly used in health certificates accompanying meat and meat products. Many of these require that the country of origin is listed as Ireland, an EU member state or another approved country. After the end of the transition period, the UK, including Northern Ireland, will not be considered an EU member state. So only products sourced from animals which meet the relevant requirements can be issued with a health cert. So it is worth checking out those requirements and the department will be providing that information to industry. In relation to the agri-food trade and tariffs, uh, obviously we have a significant trade interest with the UK and we have highly integrated supply chains. In relation to our exports to the UK in 2019, um, we had total exports of 14.5 billion, of which 5.5 billion were exported to the UK. Uh, in relation to imports, there were 10 billion uh, total imports. Uh, in, really, in 2019, of which 4.6 billion uh, were imported from the UK. On the 19th of May, the UK government announced a new global tariff regime to replace the EU external tariff regime from the 1st of January 2021. The total estimated tariff cost under that regime, based on 2019 exports to the UK, for all categories is 1.55 billion, which equates to a, an ad valorem equivalent of 28.3%. Uh, this is potentially very serious uh, for the Irish agri-food sector, especially for beef where the UK accounts for 43% of our overall beef exports. Now, that UK government analysis includes exports to Northern Ireland. Now, as you know with the protocol, there are no SBS or customs duties between trade uh, north-south. But we've done that on the basis that it, there's an assumption that all goods exported to Northern Ireland could be at risk of moving onto the GB market, which would then become liable for duties that would not apply if the goods remained in Northern Ireland. In contrast, if, if an assumption that no goods were ex, uh, ex, exported to Northern Ireland went on to the GB market, then no UK government duties uh, would apply to these exports. The true answer will probably lie somewhere between these two assumptions, but we don't have the necessary data to disentangle that NIGB trade at this point. So clearly very serious implications for agri-food trade uh, and, and, and uh, tariffs. In relation to the uh, protocol in Ireland, Northern Ireland, the dedicated Ireland, Northern Ireland protocol will take effect regardless of the outcome of the negotiations. The protocol is clear that there will be no customs or SPS checks on goods between Ireland and Northern Ireland. A specialised committee has been set up to address uh, outstanding questions uh, in relation to the implementation of that protocol. 
The first meeting of this committee uh, was held on the 30th of April. The bottom line on it is that the UK must implement the provisions of the protocol. They have published their command paper, which outlines how they intend to do so, and the EU have also published a paper on their expectations in relation to the implementation of the protocol. And of course, the implementation of the withdrawal agreement, including the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland, is essential in relation to progress, uh, progressing the negotiations on the future relationship negotiation. So in relation to um, our readiness for the 1st of January 2021, I suppose we've been preparing for the last three years uh, um, for Brexit. Um, our preparations have focused around four particular areas, our infrastructure, uh, to carry out the necessary controls at our ports and airports, the IT systems to allow us to process those imports and exports, and our staff to ensure that we have suitably uh, trained and uh, qualified staff necessary to carry out the controls at the port. And then we've engaged on a, a serious communications campaign with our operators to make sure that they're fully aware of the requirements. And uh, our, our work in this area will step up from now. And I appreciate that many operators have been focused on uh, surviving during the, the, the period gone by because of COVID. But now is the time for business to turn back and really make sure that they're fully prepared for Brexit. So just a, a, a quick overview of our import notification process. So whether it's import agents, distributors, logistics operators, supply chain companies, individuals, they will have to supply various information to ourselves and the department, also onto traces and also onto revenue systems. And uh, when that information is fed in, we, have, we will have staff will be carrying out documentary checks in the background. Those staff will be operating 24-7. Arising from those checks, we will be sending notifications to revenue um, in relation to the routing that we would want to uh, be applied to those goods when they arrive in the ports or the airport. And then um, that routing will be made known to the drivers um, coming off the ferries uh, or uh, and then the port inspection staff will be there to carry out ID or full physical inspections, documentary ID or full physical inspections. The outcome of those inspections will then be notified back to revenue and uh, advising of the, uh, the outcome, either detention if the inspections are uh, rejected uh, or um, tier the port. This is just a picture of one of our new facilities. So we've invested significant, the state has invested significantly in its, in its infrastructure in Dublin uh, Port, in Russell Airport, and in Dublin Airport um, over the last period. And this is the, a picture from the inside of our um, facility in Dublin Port, uh, known as T10. It is our animal product facility. And uh, as you can see on the right hand side, there, there are the bays where the, the containers will, uh, trucks will uh, drive up to. And then inside we have inspection rooms and uh, refrigerated storage um, uh, capacity. Um, this is another picture. This is our uh, plant and plant product facility down, it's known as T9 down in Dublin Port. And again, you know, significant investment here so that we're, we're ready for uh, checks um, on the 1st of January 2021. This is our live animal BIP uh, in, in Dublin Port. Um, we are doing some further works in Dublin Port uh, uh, during 2020, including extending our live animal BIP, some additional works in T10 in relation to uh, the detention area in there, and um, we're also trying to provide some uh, additional parking in, in Dublin Port. This is um, our uh, seal check facility um, in uh, Dublin Port. It is known as T7, 
And on the left hand side, you'll see that there's two toll boots, which are transit toll boots. And then lanes three to eight are the, uh, the Department of Agriculture um, toll boots for carrying out uh, uh, documentary and ID inspections on uh, consignments that require same. Uh, we have invested again significantly in the areas of staffing and resourcing for controls from the first of, uh, uh, well actually we had done so in advance of the uh, no deal Brexit deadlines in 2019. Some of those staff have been redeployed across the department, um, but they, will, they are being brought back in for training during the course of 2020. And um, we are Re-examining our staffing requirement currently um, in light of UK requirements regarding export certification and um, further uh, work that we're doing in relation to modelling our operations down at the port. Um, that work is ongoing at the moment, but uh, from the 1st of January 2021, we will have staff operating 24-7 in Dublin port. And we will also have them operating in back offices in relation to uh, the documentary checks. They will be operating 24-7. And in Ross Lair, the staff in the court will be operating on an extended um, hours basis. So one of the things that we did last year, we, we did uh, some, uh, anal well, we've been doing analysis since 2018, but uh, we, we took the time um, afforded to us with the uh, withdrawal agreement, uh, with, with the agreement on the withdrawal agreement on the revised uh, protocol in Ireland, Northern Ireland, to maybe go back and do some further in-depth analysis. Um, and we looked at the roll-on, roll-off manifest analysis from the UK, and we got data from revenue. And there were over 1,800 unique descriptions for freight units. Um, on that data over uh, over a year, and we classified them into 25 different categories. And um, you'll have to understand that one of the great advantages of the single market and the customs union was that we didn't have to go into the details of what was on um, uh, the the, uh, the consignment and the truck. But obviously, this is now of significant importance now that we will be trading with the UK as a third country. So there was a significant body of work done in relation to the manifest analysis. And um, I'm going to give you a flavor of uh, some of the things that, um, that we found. So in terms of, uh, as I said, it was one year's uh, row row manifest data from the UK. We're quite unique in uh, a bit that it deals with RORO. There's not too many examples uh, across Europe that de deals with RORO traffic at a bit. Um, and uh, that is a challenge in and of itself. Um, as I said, we looked at the manifest data between the 23rd of February 2019 and the 25th of February 2022. And we tried to um, assign them into different boxes of potential interest uh, to, to the department. Uh, I should say that um, the data is not a complete year's data in that revenue had to remove um, from that data set uh, data where the consignment descriptions, uh, descriptions appeared less than 10 times for commercial um, uh, reasons. So it was, this isn't the full data set, but it gives you a very good flavor of the kind of uh, challenge that we're facing. And I should say, um, currently in Dublin Port, we deal with three, circa three and a half thousand consignments from third countries. So now from the 1st of January, 2021, and these are estimates, and I do want to stress that these are estimates. Based on the 2019 analysis, we're looking at Dublin Port um, uh, taking in 408,000 trucks. Um, and of those, we estimate that there's roughly 41% of them are of interest to the department. The figures are much lower for Ross Airport, only around uh, 39,000 trucks 
came into Ross Airport, and of them, around 33% are of interest to the department. Um, Again, I thought it was interesting maybe to share with you the monthly patterns for the number of freight units coming into Dublin Port. And you see some peaks before March and before October. They were associated, no doubt, with the no deal Brexit deadlines um, uh, in 2019. And uh, again, just useful to, to see where the peaks. So in January, it's probably one of the quieter times of the year. Um, uh, also, mid-summer and December, quiet, quiet as well. But we obviously don't know how trade will change from the 1st of January 2021. Uh, and and that, that change in trade will very much be dependent on the outcome of the negotiations on the future relationship between the EU and the UK. Um, in relation to the weekly patterns, again, quite interesting so that people can maybe see. So the, the week that we're looking at here is uh, a week uh, between the 8th of the 7th and 19th and the 14th of the 7th and 19th. And uh, this week was chosen uh, to represent an average week. And um, uh, the total number of DASM interest rate units over that average week this was 3,255. But again, you can see that there is differences in terms of you know, where, when those busy times are. And again, it's something that businesses may wish to consider um, uh, in their planning for the, the 1st of January 2021. I know that the department is considering uh, how we deal with these uh, peaks. Again, the daily patterns. So again, in relation to the daily patterns, this graph represents the total number of freight units um, per arrival time on the busiest day of the average week. And note that the peak times will change uh, for freight units depending on the day. But this was just to give you a flavor of what that would look like. So again, you can see very clearly a morning peak and a, an, an evening peak. Again, something that you may wish to consider in your in your planning. Um, regarding the UK post transition import controls, which are really what will be our export uh, requirements, um, there is significant uncertainty uh, remaining in, in this area, which makes preparation very difficult. Nevertheless, the UK government did make an announcement on the 12th of June where they basically have a phased application of their import control regime. We are expecting their uh, release of the UK government border operations manual, and, and that will be important to examine that in great detail to understand exactly what our exporters will have to uh, comply with when exporting to the UK. So what do we actually know? Well, uh, from the 1st of January 2021, traders who are importing uh, goods will have to have up to six months to submit their customs declarations to HMRC. If tariffs are applicable, they will need to be paid on imports from 1 January. Payments can be deferred until the customs declaration has been made at the latest, the 1st of July 2021. Safety and security declarations will not be required for six months for all goods. Traders will, however, need to consider some other processes, such as how they will account for import VAT. They're primarily revenue concerns, but I, I said I'd share them with you. From my point of view, all traders importing live animals and high-risk plants and plant products will be required to have pre-notification and health documentation from the 1st of January 2021. Imports of high-risk animal products will also need pre-notification um, and documentary checks will be carried out remotely and physical checks of high-risk goods will take place at destination or other authorised premises. From April 2021, 
all products of animal origin and all regulated plants and plant products will also require pre-notification and the relevant health documentation. And from July 2021, traders moving all goods will have to make full declarations and pay tariffs at the point of importation. Full safety and security declarations will be introduced, while for SBS commodities there will be an increase in physical checks and the taking of samples. Checks for animals, plants and their products will take place at GB border control posts. We are dependent on the UK government for the source of information on their intentions for import control. So you will need to understand fully and comply with these requirements if you want to continue to export to the UK. So this is um, just by way of example. So we obviously had to prepare um, export certification because there were requirements in relation to um, export certification um, in the event of a no-deal Brexit. So again, um, the, the individuals or the FBO or their staff will be able to um, uh, submit a request to the department. We have two different ways of doing that. Um, one is uh, anonymously or the other is to our uh, single sign-on um, application, which basically is much more user-friendly and our systems uh, record and, and retain information that you use on a regular basis. That application then is sent to, our central ad, to a central admin who, if there are particular queries, can refer them back to the uh, uh, FBO or the operator um, who's made the application. Um, we have built in multiple uh, sign-off stages, and again, you know, we need to wait await the outcome of the UK um, requirement in this regard before we can decide or finalise arrangements in this space. But ultimately, it would lead to the uh, generation of uh, an, an export uh, certificate. Obviously, the land bridge is a critically important route to market. From the 1st of January 2021, animals and goods moving across the UK land bridge must be placed under the customs transit procedure in order to maintain their union status. And EU regulations require SPS controls on animals and goods transiting a third country. Um, Again, we, we await the detail on any UK requirements in relation to goods transiting, um, animals and goods transiting the, uh, the, uh, the land bridge. I, I suppose for me, one of the key messages I want to relay today is that if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. I'm advised by colleagues down in the port that 67% of rejections from third countries are due to documentary errors with a further 12% being rejected because of inconsistencies between the documentation and the identity checks. So I ask, how prepared are you? Is the person responsible for the import or the agent acting on your behalf registered with revenue for an EORI number? Are they registered with the department and or the HSC? Or if you're bringing in fishery uh, products um, with SFDA? Are you registered on Traces NT? What I would say is contact Brexit registration at agriculture.gov.ie and we can help you. Do you know the CN codes of the goods you were importing? Do you know the EU import requirements for those CN codes? Can your suppliers in Great Britain fulfill the EU requirements for exporting these CN codes to the EU? regarding their establishment and any necessary certification required for the product. Who is going to comply with the pre-notification requirement uh, of at least 24 hours in advance, including the submission of the correct uh, certification and supporting documents? Please consider groupage and your mixed loads. Single loads are faster for everybody. Appreciate that uh, for, for those of you in, involved in various sectors, including the retail sector, uh, single loads aren't feasible. However, you should uh, consider uh, 
the organization of your loads um, going forward. Um, is in particular, consider access to food um, and, and those consignments that require checking when you're packing your, um, your uh, lorries. Ensure wood packaging material meets the required standards. Um, they are the ISPM 15 standards and ensure your driver has connectivity for accessing routing in ports. Knowing the answers to these questions and preparing now will assist in the timely clearance of your consignment at the border control post. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you need help, we have a call centre in the department, we have an email address and we have our website. And we will be doing much more outreach uh, to our stakeholders uh, in the second half of this year. Um, it wasn't appropriate to do so during uh, the COVID situation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Louise, for that extremely useful and most comprehensive and almost technical. Um, and I think it's exactly what our, our listeners were, need, were needing. There is um, there is a number of questions in here, um, and um, so I just to, just to say to people that are that are listening in, um, so a lot of people send us the, the questions directly to either Blondine or myself. That's okay, um, if if you feel like it. Can I? Um, I suppose I, what what I just want to start with is to go right back to the very beginning, and and it and it is is to make sure that you're giving a very clear message. Okay, my understanding is, no matter the outcome. We are not heading for frictionless trade. Do you want to just expand on that a bit? Absolutely, that is exactly uh, the case. So, with a, with a free trade agreement uh, or without a free trade agreement, the UK uh, is a third country, and there are requirements on trade between the EU and the UK that will apply from the first of January, twenty twenty one. Obviously, from our point of view, um, uh, those uh, requirements relate to customs and SPS uh, checks. The big difference will be whether or not there's a trade agreement that, uh, um, where there is uh, tariff-free and quota-free access. And obviously, both the UK uh, and ourselves are, are very keen to have a, a trade agreement that provides uh, for tariff-free and quota-free access, but the requirements in relation to the checks apply. The nature of those checks, the UK um, have asked that uh, the EU give consideration to maybe reducing the frequency of those checks. Um, they have submitted a non-paper on equivalence, which uh, would and the request is basically to reduce the frequency of those SDS checks. Equivalence is very much linked to regulatory divergence. You can't separate the two, and the UK have a very clear position in relation to their desire to uh, diverge from EU regulations. So that is a very difficult uh, circle to square at the moment, And um, but absolutely, Regardless of the outcome of the trade negotiations from the 1st of January 2021, there will be checks at the borders uh, for goods imported from GB and, uh, and, and there will be delays. There will be fees for uh, those uh, import controls. There will be delays and we are doing our utmost to prepare sufficiently so that those delays are minimized to the extent that we can. But we are remaining in the EU. We export goods to 180 countries around the world. We do that on the back of our membership of the European Union and of the very high standards that we uh, operate to within Ireland. And it is essential for Ireland that uh, we uh, comply with those rules and um, and therefore there will be checks on the border and businesses need to prepare for those checks. Thanks Louise and, and uh, one of the things when you mentioned that there will be checks on the border, um, one of those borders is, is Belfast, it's in the harbour potentially coming down into the country. 
Um, and my, my sense of what's happening around the protocol is that there, there is movement in principle, but there seems to be um, less rapidity in there being any evidence of the UK side of things um, actually making any progress. Um, what do you, how do you see that developing over the next six months? What will actually be in place? What will happen? What can people expect if they have goods coming in through Belfast? If there are goods coming in through Belfast, they should ex expect the exact same as the goods coming in through Dublin. The, the port in Belfast has to operate as if it is a, a border control post and goods entering the north from GB or from other third countries will be expected to go through the same processes that are goods entering Dublin port will be. And in, in terms of the rapidity, uh, I, I know from contacting colleagues uh, uh, in both uh, the North and in DEFRA that their works are ongoing in relation to the implementation of the protocol. And there are a lot of people working very hard um, in, in terms of uh, ensuring that the protocol is implemented. Uh, and it is essential that it is implemented fully and that that's visible to to all. Thanks, Louise. Um, just a couple of questions here now that are being sent in. Um, okay, so how do we overcome timelines around health certificates from the Department of Agriculture currently around five days? Can we expect the stock will sit in port? In, in terms of export certification, for this is for goods that are being exported. Uh, I'm, I'm just reading out the question as it is uh, as it is exactly written. If that person would like to elaborate, come back to me. Um, but yes, it would be. I think. Okay, so I can tell you that uh, colleagues across this department are changing how they're operating, and there will be changes to how we. Uh, operate um, going forward to make sure that we can um, provide the necessary certification for trade to continue uh, uh, to trade after the transition. Um, that's a two-way street. Businesses will also have to change. So it's not just a one-way street. Businesses also have to make the necessary changes, but we are working to ensure that uh, whatever we have to do to ensure that trade moves as smoothly as it can, we'll do so after the uh, uh, from the 1st of January next year. Okay, and sorry, that, that questioner did come back and say it was definitely in relation to exports. Okay, uh, just reading down here. Um, Will there be any flexibility on the pre-notification time frame of 24 hours? If a truck gets an earlier ferry, will he be able to proceed with clearance on arrival provided documents are available? So in relation to the 24-hour pre-notification, I, I think people really need to understand why uh, we're asking for that. I put up a slide that showed that the vast majority of rejections were, were linked to failures in documentary uh, checks. If you provide us with that, those, note, those paperwork in advance and, and allow us the time to go through that and go back to you with any queries, that actually assists businesses. That should assist businesses in trying to get through the port quicker. We did consider reducing the 24-hour uh, period notification, but we don't think that it is in businesses' interests. I would also say that for a lot of businesses, I appreciate we have just-in-time uh, uh, supply chains, but for a lot of businesses, there are standard orders, repeat orders, so there should be a good amount of clarity in relation to those orders coming in. But we, we strongly believe that reducing the 24-hour period advance notification is not in industry's interest. Sorry, and could you just repeat the second question? 
Um, okay, so will there be any flexibility on the pre-notification time frame 24 hours? If a truck gets in, it's a connected question, so if the truck gets in an, uh, on an earlier ferry, will uh, the driver be able to, sorry, that will the driver be able to proceed with clearance on arrival provided documents are available? So the uh, revenue are introducing a new customs roll-on, roll-off service from the um, beginning of November. And I think it would be very well worthwhile that you would ask them to come and speak at a, an event, a, a future Irish Exporters Association webinar. But there are um, new requirements in relation to pre-boarding notification, whereby um, the uh, importer, uh, the person who is uh, coming on a ferry from, uh, the U from GB over to Ireland, will have to submit uh, their uh, ENS and various, their MRN, whether that's a, a TAD or a SAD, I'm sorry, these are all uh, um, revenue terms that I'm beginning to become accustomed to. And um, once those documents are uh, submitted and uh, revenue are then able to cross-check against um, uh, the single window, it's a, an EU uh, platform whereby they can check if the necessary documentation is submitted uh, in relation to certain uh, um, commodities, for instance, animals and, and products of animal origin. So uh, once those documents are submitted in advance and uh, once then uh, at ramps up then, we are, revenue will send us information that will tell us the trailers that are on, uh, or the, the trucks that are on that ferry. And once we have the documentation received in advance, and once uh, we have done our uh, checks, then I don't see any particular issue uh, with um, uh, that uh, truck uh, uh, going on an earlier ferry, provided that the documentation has been provided in advance. Does it need to be 24 hours in advance of the truck? Uh, that's the question, I think. I think. Yes, well, yes is the answer. Yes is the answer. It does need to be 24 hours in advance. But you can you can provide that longer in, you know, but yes, 24 hours is the, is the, the, the notification period. Okay. Okay, so a lot of these questions that are coming um, in directly are in relation to delays, just to say that. So, so here's another one. Based on the number of trailers identified as of potential interest to your department, it would appear that there could be 400 trucks, 400 trucks per day of interest to DF, DAFM. Will there be sufficient, and I know you're talking about kind of getting everybody ready in that, but will there be sufficient resources available to cope with this? What time per truck is anticipated to deal with a truck arriving in good order with paperwork? So firstly, we will have sufficient resources down at the port. Um, in terms of how long will the, the checks take, it depends very much on whether it is a documentary, an ID check, or whether it's a physical inspection. And it depends on what's in your truck. So I, I can't answer that, you know, like, but I can tell you that as a department, we are working extremely hard to ensure the, um, checks get done in as fast a turnaround time as possible. But people need to be aware that there will be, it isn't going to be the same as today where you can just roll off the ferry and out of the port. There will be delays. Oh, I can assure you, and given that we've been through COVID, we understand and recognize the importance of supply chains and keeping those supply chains moving. Um, so we're very alert to this uh, situation and we're doing uh, everything that we can to make sure that those uh, those delays are as minimal as possible. Thanks, Louise. I know we're slightly over, but there is two more questions here which I think are worth um, calling out. Um, you know, when you had a slide up there which showed the preparation um, for the country, which is around infrastructure, IT systems, your own staff, um, and operator preparedness. There's two questions in relation to that. One is, are you aware um, in your discussions with your British counterparts how ready they are on those four categories? Um, 
and and will they be ready by the end of the year bearing in mind that they have rolled a number of items on six months uh, you mentioned operator preparedness and you'll be engaging in that what does that look like um, and then I have one more question then we and then we'll probably finish up I think there are really questions that you should ask uh, my counterpart in the UK, if you don't mind. Um, I do know that there have been concerns in relation to uh, the UK ability to provide uh, certification, et cetera, for goods that are being exported to Ireland. Um, and, and that is something that we are engaging, along with other many other areas, and it is something that we are engaging with our counterparts in the UK on. Um, but I think that question is really more appropriate maybe for my opposite in the UK. And then just in terms of um, your engagement with the operators, you said that you were going to be ramping that up. What does that look like? Well, I, th I think firstly it's going to be a whole of government approach. Uh, our communications um, uh, during 2019 were um, coordinated centrally um, uh, and, and I expect that they and not that I expect, I know that they will be um, uh, done the same in, 20, in the second half of 2020. Um, we will have a number of uh, uh, engagements. Uh, we had a, a joint comms calendar with revenue because we really see um, uh, the interaction between customs and SBS authorities as key. Um, we will be hosting some uh, online webinars. Obviously, COVID has impacted firstly in relation to uh, any communications that we had uh, planned at the early part of the year. We have our Brexit Stakeholder Consultative Committee and we engage regularly with industry. Um, in 2019, we communicated and uh, uh, we asked Revenue to issue a number, a, a notice on our behalf to people who traded, uh, imported, uh, or exported uh, with the UK, and we will be doing similar communication in um, uh, the second half of this year. But there will be many, I, I can assure you, uh, people will hear loads about Brexit in the second half of this year. And, and, and that's important that businesses really turn their attention. And I appreciate that things have been extremely challenging for businesses in the agri food sector and more generally. But it is important that businesses now uh, refocus their attention on Brexit um, in, in the second half of this year. I, I agree with you, Louise. Can I just ask you, because it's one, it's something that troubles me a lot, um, it, and it really does trouble me a lot, is around the rules of origin, uh, integrated supply chains, trade yeah. north south, and the interpretation of free trade agreements. Our, our understanding is that it, it is up to the third country with whom the trade agreement is with to interpret um, the, the rules of origin of the goods that are coming into it under that trade agreement. And so we have a, we have a number of questions that our members are putting to us, which is, number one, if I'm exporting out of the, the north, can I participate uh, freely in both um, EU and UK free trade agreements? Um, and, I, and I don't think there's a clear answer to that yet, because the, the, the answer may well lie with the other country. Um, number one, and what happens? You, you, you mentioned that um, uh, goods coming in from the UK and Northern Ireland will have UK origin. So, what happens where there's, you know, a, an integrated supply chain, and there's goods been exported uh, out of Ireland to a, to a third country? What happens in, in that case? Okay, so so the first thing I'm going to say is that uh, rules of origin are customs rules. Okay, so again, I would advise that you might get somebody to come and speak to you from customs uh, uh, on rules of origin. Under Article 4 of the protocol, Northern Ireland uh, will remain in the UK customs territory. So goods from Northern Ireland are, uh, uh, cannot be considered as EU origin for the purpose of determining customs origin of a product. Okay. 
Um, the uh, going back to your first question, sorry, you used two questions in that. Your first question was in relation to could uh, the the Northern Ireland product uh, benefit from both EU FTAs and from uh, UK yeah. FTAs. My understanding is no. no mine is too. Mine yeah. is too. And then that has implications for yeah, the supply chain, then, isn't it? It, it does. So where you're, where you are, so. Where the trade is primarily, let's say there's a, a, a trade agreement agreed between the EU and the UK. So, and there's preferential uh, uh, trade arrangements uh, within that trade agreement. If you're exporting between the EU and the UK, that issue doesn't arise because you should be able to claim the preferential tariff rates within that agreement. However, if you are exporting, let's say you're bringing goods from Northern Ireland down into the Republic of Ireland that have been then exported on to a third country that the EU has an FTA with. There will be rules within that FTA that are very specific to that product and including a, perhaps setting a limit on the amount or the percentage of non-originating content, but be very clear the Northern Ireland content will be not uh, EU origin for the purpose of that. The other thing that I mentioned on my slides was around the market access. So um, we don't have free trade agreements with all our uh, exporting partners, but we do have um, protocols or agreements in relation to market access in those markets. Some of those markets have very specific requirements around country of origin. And it will be important that any exporters to those markets understand fully what those requirements are to make sure that they can meet those requirements. Alternatively, there may be a need to uh, re-examine supply chains. Um, and, and just before I let you go, Louise, a question has just popped in from um, one of our listeners, which is, that you've mentioned that there will be charges for services. Does this mean that the department will be charging for their services? So, so EU legislation sets down that there are fees on uh, uh, controls on imports uh, at, uh, at border control posts. So we are we currently charge uh, on uh, uh, fees for official controls on imports from third countries. And we are obliged by EU law to charge fees on uh, controls uh, from the 1st of January that are going to come from GB. So my, with my understanding being correct that any in, increase in costs that, that um, exporters or importers might face might be, from the, might be the fact that it's the same type of costs applicable to a third country. The UK just happens to be a third country now and, and we'll will have to bear trade will have to prepare those costs is that correct or is there additional costs okay no no that's that's absolutely correct so it's the same it's the same rules will apply regardless of whether it's gb or another third country perfect listen louise that was um that was really very 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 useful very insightful and i think we'll be having you back in in a matter of weeks or months um, it, it was useful. There are there is some other questions which I we will we will send on to you. I'm just conscious of time. Um, a big thank you to you for being with us today. It was it was very informative. Thank you to everybody for joining us as well. And um, I just want to re-mention all our training courses because they do deal with a lot of the things that um, Louise has mentioned and help you get ready for those. So thank you everybody, um, and we look forward to having you with us all again soon. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Bundy.